In this video, we're going to talk about everything that you need to know about hip osteoarthritis. We're going to dispel some common misconceptions about hip arthritis, and we'll discuss the latest advances in non-surgical and surgical treatment options. Hello, this is Dr. Grant Cooper from Princeton Spine and Joint Center. Hip osteoarthritis is the degradation and the loss of cartilage in your hip joint. Cartilage is like a sponge that holds the joint fluid in your joint. When your joint's at rest, the fluid goes into the sponge. Then when you move your hip joint, the sponge is squeezed and the fluid exits the sponge and it bathes the joint. At rest, the fluid then returns back into the sponge. As you lose the cartilage or the sponge, you lose your ability to hold onto joint fluid inside of your hip. And so the hip doesn't have the same cushioning and lubrication in the joint as it should. And as a result of this loss, other parts of the hip have to step up and bear the joint's load more and more than it did before. And this leads to a cascade of degenerative changes in and around the joint. Bone spurs or osteophytes can develop, for example, because the hip is trying to make new bone to help compensate for the lack of cushioning in the joint. Interestingly, the degenerative changes of osteoarthritis alone don't cause pain. Now, one way we know this is that almost everyone after the age of 60 is going to have at least some amount of osteoarthritis in the hip. But of course, many or most don't have hip pain. Sometimes a patient will have severe pain in one hip, but not the other hip, even though on x-ray or MRI, both hips will show the same amount of arthritis. Now, how do we explain this? Why is it that so often it happens that symptoms don't correlate to the degree of arthritis on the film? The answer is that what causes the hip pain from osteoarthritis is if the body responds to the wear and tear in the hip with inflammation. And it's that inflammatory response that will either cause pain or not. Now, what leads one person to develop inflammation in the hip in response to osteoarthritis and another person to not have an inflammatory reaction to a similar amount of osteoarthritis? And that's a great question, and a Nobel Prize might be waiting for whomever figures out a hard and fast rule to that question. Clearly, though, there's going to be many factors, including the person's activity level, the strength of the surrounding muscles, tightness of the surrounding muscles. All of this can lead to an altered gait that's going to put even more pressure on the hip, um, the person's diet, their body weight, medical history, genetics, and of course, good old-fashioned luck is going to help determine these things. As as Lefty Gomez, the 1930s Yankee baseball pitcher, uh, is said to have said, I'd rather be lucky than good. Well, I'd rather have lots of arthritis and be lucky with no inflammation than have minimal arthritis and be unlucky with lots of inflammation because both of those things can occur. Okay, so we understand that what drives the symptoms of hip pain and stiffness is the inflammatory reaction to the arthritis. And of course, the arthritis makes it more likely that you'll indeed have an inflammatory reaction. So what is inflammation and you know, how do we make it stop? Well, inflammation is in fact a protein response in the body, but the best way for us to think about inflammation in, in this context is that it's like a fire. And when we think of treating the hip, there are two ways to put out a fire. One way is to move away the sticks and let the fire die out on its own. In the surgeon's world, that's gonna mean surgery. That is to say, the surgeon will structurally fix the hip, generally by replacing it, although not always. More on that in a little bit. In a non-surgical world, moving away the sticks from the fire generally means exercise. By stretching and strengthening the surrounding muscles, in particular the hip abductors, the hip extensors, and the hip adductor muscles, as well as the core stabilizing muscles, you can take some of the pressure off of the affected hip and allow it to hopefully rest so the fire hopefully dies out on its own. Think of it this way, with every step that you take, there's a force that's going to go up through your heel to your ankle, knee, hip, and spine. As that force passes to your hip, if the muscles contract properly and are strong enough, then those muscles will take the force onto themselves. But if the muscles are weak or they're too tight, then the force is still gonna pass through the hip, but now that force from the heel strike is going to pass directly through the joint and contribute to irritating it and degrading it further. Muscles, in a sense, can help or not, but the joint can't get out of the way of gravity. When you're doing exercises for hip osteoarthritis, it's important to not just stretch and strengthen the muscles around the hip 
and the core stabilizing muscles, but you also want to do things like evaluate the gait and see if that gait can also be improved. Sometimes, for example, if someone has flat feet uh, and the person, you know, they tend to hyperpronate while walking, a subtle orthotic to help restore the arch can take the pressure off the entire kinetic chain while walking. Additionally, the hip is, of course, a weight bearing joint. And so hip osteoarthritis is going to be exacerbated by the force of gravity. And because of this, reducing your body weight to a healthy weight is going to be helpful because it'll reduce the force that's going through your hip. For every pound of weight that you lose, your hip will experience six pounds of less force going through it. So look, you don't have to starve yourself or be too skinny, but you know, the reality is that having a healthy body weight is very helpful. Okay, let's return to the inflammation we were fighting in the hip. Now, sometimes you do a great job of moving away the sticks with exercises, uh, improving the body's biomechanics, but that fire just keeps on burning. In these instances, you may need to put water onto the fire. Water in this instance is generally one of four types of injections. The most common injection is an intraarticular steroid injection in the hip. Steroids are a powerful anti-inflammatory medication. They can be delivered directly to the hip. The problem with steroid injections in the hip joint is that steroids just aren't very good for hip joints. If you're, well, I should say especially if you're doing repeated steroid injections. Realistically, one hip injection is very unlikely to harm the hip. But look, it's an important consideration because you don't want to find yourself in a pattern where you keep on injecting the hip joint again and again with steroids, or you will risk serious complications, such as avascular necrosis, in which the femoral head essentially is starved of blood supply, uh, as in starved of nutrients, and the, the bone begins to die. But as a quick fix, a steroid injection is very good at reducing the inflammation in a hip joint. Another type of injection into the hip is ketorolac. Ketorolac is also called Toradol, and this is basically like a liquid Advil or a liquid Aleve. Studies have shown that injecting Toradol for hip osteoarthritis may work as well as steroids. And the big advantage of this approach is that Toradol doesn't have the same potential del deleterious effects on the hip joint. So it's attractive because of that. The main disadvantages are one, if someone has a contraindication to, to non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and two, you know, there just hasn't been as much experience with injectable Toradol as there has with steroids. But still, this is something to consider. A third type of injection is a very different approach. One can inject viscosupplementation. This is basically a synthetic joint fluid. This joint fluid can be injected into the hip. Now recall that the underlying problem in hip osteoarthritis is a lack of cartilage, and that cartilage holds onto the joint fluid, so as you lose the cartilage or the sponge, you lose the lubricating and nourishing joint fluid. Well, we can't replace the cartilage. We don't know how to do that yet but we can replace the joint fluid. And the nice thing about this approach is that you're putting in a joint fluid into the joint, and that fluid actually belongs in the joint. So in a sense, it's a more you know, natural solution. The use of visco supplementation for hip osteoarthritis is very well studied, and it is very effective. The problem is that since we aren't replacing the cartilage, the joint fluid gets reabsorbed by the body slowly. The effects of visco supplementation tend to last about six months for most people. Now, the fourth type of injection is regenerative medicine, in which the hip osteoarthritis is prompted to repair itself by injecting around it using one of a few products. Regenerative techniques are becoming more popular with every passing year, and there's slowly a growing body of research that's starting to support its usage. The most popular regenerative technique is PRP, this is a procedure where you aspirate the patient's blood, you use a centrifuge to spin down the platelets and the growth factors, and then you inject those platelets and growth factors back into the pathologic site with the idea that the growth factors and platelets will attract the body's own healing mechanisms. Other similar techniques include injectable prolotherapy, uh, amniotic fluid, bone marrow aspirate. There are a bunch of other approaches. All of these are basically trying to get the body to essentially heal itself. A major drawback for all of these approaches is that insurance almost never covers any of these procedures, and this is because while evidence for them is certainly growing, the data does remain relatively sparse. Now, personally, if PRP were a covered procedure, I would often recommend PRP 
particularly if visco supplementation isn't working. However, regenerative medicine techniques can be quite expensive. They usually cost somewhere between $750 and $3,000 or more, depending on the particular doctor and the particular regenerative technique that's being considered. Importantly, if an injection is being performed, it really must be done under fluoroscopic, meaning x-ray guidance or ultrasound guidance. Without image guidance, you really can't hope to know if you're actually in the hip joint. So image guidance for injections in the hip is a non-negotiable, absolutely must have. Okay, back to our fire analogy. If you're throwing water onto the fire with an injection, it's best to think of that injection, no matter which injection you use, as providing a window of opportunity to allow you to learn some exercises to start changing the mechanics so that the fire doesn't return in a few months. If all you do is a steroid injection and you don't follow through with some exercise to improve the overall biomechanics, well, steroid shots tend to work for about three months on average. And as we mentioned, if all you do is visco supplementation, you tend to get about six months of relief. The way to make injections part of a comprehensive treatment that fixes the problem instead of just temporarily addresses it is to couple the injection with the appropriate exercises in order to tweak the biomechanics so the inflammation doesn't return. Now look, sometimes, despite the best efforts with non-surgical care, that fire just keeps on burning or it just keeps on coming back. So when should one consider surgery? There's no hard and fast rule on this, but most orthopedists who do total hip replacements will say that they only want to do the surgery when the patient is basically crawling into their office because the hip pain is so bad. These surgeons want to do it for those patients because the reality is that after a hip replacement, the hip usually isn't going to feel 100% better like when you were you know, 18 or 19. Instead, the hip might feel 80 to 95% better, um, but it, you, know, you still might feel a little stiff or just not normal. So if you go into surgery with minimal pain and just want the hip to be perfect, and I've had patients like this before, then that patient's going to be disappointed when the hip isn't perfect. You know, I had a patient who came to see me after they had gotten a hip replacement because they were angry at their orthopedist and they wanted advice of what to do next. So the patient was around 70. Uh, she was very active and she had received a hip replacement for a hip that basically she described it as feeling tight. And, you know, she would feel sore after playing tennis or golf. After the hip replacement, the soreness after tennis and golf did go away, but it didn't feel completely normal to her. So this was a perfect example of someone who should never have been given a hip replacement in the first place because she was way too functional and had way too little pain before the surgery to justify it. So in her mind, the hip replacement was a way just to get a nuisance out of the way and have a completely fine hip like when she was a kid. When the hip wasn't 100%, she was upset, she was disappointed. You know, the surgeon didn't do a bad job with the hip replacement. The surgeon did a bad job of talking to the patient about realistic expectations from a hip replacement surgery. There was clearly a lack of communication. Now, if a patient has lots of pain and difficulty with their activity, and then they get a replacement and they feel 80 to 90% better, that patient is generally extremely happy. And orthopedists, at least the good ones, they want happy patients. So for me, I would say if you have hip osteoarthritis, but you can get at least six months of being relatively pain-free with visco supplementation and home therapy exercises, as an example, then I personally think that it's better to put off a hip replacement at that moment. If it takes more than that to keep you out of pain and enjoying life, then I think a hip replacement becomes a much more attractive option or at least should be on the table. So with that, it's a very individual decision. There are all sorts of variables that need to go into the calculus of when to have for hip replacement, such as your age, the general medical condition, level of pain, degree of debility, um, and of course, like your personal aspirations in terms of what you want to be doing with your hip and with your body more generally. Now, there's another surgical alternative for some people, which is an osteotomy. If the patient is young and the cartilage damage in the hip is limited to a small area in the hip, then an osteotomy might be a good option. This is a much smaller surgery than a total hip replacement. In the osteotomy, the surgeon rotates the arthritic bone away from the hip joint, and this allows the weight-bearing force to be translated through the non-arthritic parts of the joint. So obviously, this is an attractive option if it's available. Another option for a more damaged hip is a partial hip replacement, also called a hemiarthroplasty. 
In this surgery, only one part of the hip joint, the femoral head, is replaced instead of also replacing the acetabulum. This type of replacement is generally performed in older patients who have had a hip fracture. Total hip replacement is a big procedure, but as big surgeries go, total hip replacement is a very effective and successful procedure for most patients. There are more than 450,000 total hip replacements done each year in the United States alone. That's a lot of hips being replaced. It's a lot of experience with them. Infection and blood clots and a problem with the prosthesis are three of the most feared complications, and obviously all of this needs to be discussed with your surgeon. One last consideration is how long do hip replacements last? This is a particularly important consideration for younger patients because replacing a replacement is a lot more difficult and a lot more complicated than just doing the initial replacement. In general, total hip replacements are thought to last for about 15 to 20 years or longer. Now, confidentially, I've had surgical colleagues tell me that they think the newest replacements will last for much longer than that. The trouble with that opinion is that the techniques and the prostheses that are being put in, well, they haven't been around that long. So a lot of the prognostication is based on material science, lab data, and then also best guesses. Still, it's a good bet that most modern hip replacements will last at least 15 years, maybe much longer. Part of the conversation about how long the replacement will last is what you plan on doing with the hip. If you're engaging in low impact activities such as walking, swimming, biking, golfing, it, the hip is going to last a lot longer than if you decide to go training in marathons and playing pickup basketball twice a day, for example, which you know, is going to involve a lot more jumping and running and cutting back and forth. The last point I'd like to make about surgery is that if surgery is needed, then the stronger you go into a surgery, the stronger and quicker that you're going to come out of it. A lot of times, if someone's going to go for a hip replacement surgery, then that person just stops moving and they stop doing any rehab exercises because they figure, ah, well, I'll just wait until the hip is fixed. This is invariably a big mistake because the muscles that you'll need after the surgery are going to become weaker and more atrophied if you're not working them. Even if you're going to go for surgery, and perhaps especially if you're going to go for surgery, the more you can work with a physical therapist on structured exercises, for you to get ready for the surgery, the easier time that you're going to have on the back end of the surgery. Okay, as always, if you have any questions or comments, or if you have any requests for future videos, please leave us a comment in the comment section. Please remember to hit the like button. Uh, it helps us with our YouTube algorithm. We really appreciate your support. If you haven't already subscribed to our channel, then please consider doing so now. Thank you very much.